Welcome to today's 3D print. Today we're going to go over an analysis of the FL Sun Q5. So stay tuned as we talk about this printer. First off, I'm sorry about the noise. I have six printers going. They're all printing these face shields. Which I'm working on. I got a big stack of failures here. Not from this printer, from the other printers. This one's actually doing pretty good. Um, but these things here, I'm sending off to TH3D to have made into face shields. So I have a whole bunch of machines going making them. <laughs> and uh, um, I'll be doing another video pretty soon on creating stacks, sequential printing in the Z axis. So that's a lot of fun. That's a few stacks. So that's going to be like a paperweight. <laughs> Anyway, this is the FL Sun Q5. This is their latest Delta printer, and it's targeted toward beginners. I don't think Delta printers are very ideal for beginners because there are potential issues dealing with Delta that are harder to fix for a beginner. But this is the closest I've seen to a truly beginner-friendly Delta printer. Impressively so. Um, it's fast. It's quiet, except for the fans, and the print quality is spot on. I had virtually zero issues getting this thing operating and going. Color touchscreen, um, fanless power supply, though it does have a cooling fan, um, exhausting the air from the top case, um, elegantly designed, aluminum rails, rigid structure, largely pre-assembled. Um, it comes in assemblies, each of these Towers, they're called, are pre-assembled. The top's pre-assembled. The bottom's pre-assembled. You basically use these same bolts throughout the entire printer. It comes with one bag of one type of bolt, and you use that to assemble everything. Um, you basically screw these three towers into this top, plugging the wires in. They're already marked, so you can make sure you plug them into the correct ports. Then these three towers screw into the base, and then your effector, with your effector arms, screws into your tower trolleys. These screws are already on here. It's already assembled. All you do is screw the two screws in here and here, and you're done. Plug in your Bowden tube. Plug in all of the pre-marked cables, and your printer is ready to go. It comes with a attachable bed leveling option. Because, um, I do not suggest any Delta printer to anybody who's not very familiar with Delta printers unless it has automatic bed leveling and automatic mesh bed leveling. They are absolutely critical for a Delta because you cannot mechanically level a delta printer the z x and y are not they don't exist there is no x y and z all right on a delta printer all three axes are virtual okay it requires coordination of all three towers and all three motors in order to generate virtual x y and z you're looking at that now with the really wicked kinematics it's, it's very addictive to watch a delta work it's beautiful they're, they're almost liquid in motion the way they work. But as you can see, there is no x-axis, there is no y-axis, and there is no z-axis. All three arms have to move in mathematical unison to generate virtual x, y, and z mathematically. Which means you can't diagnose or repair mechanically very easily because there's nothing mechanical to fix. It's all brains. It's all electronic. It's all math. When it's done right, like this, <laughs> you're good. You're golden. When it's done wrong, you'll pull a revolver to your forehead and blow your own brains out. <laughs> Unless you're very good with the math and learn the math and can get into the code and mess with the code. Um, but this one is done very well. So the way that works is you have a little, um, it works like a BL touch kind of thing. There's a little micro switch. Let me show you that. Right there. And that has a magnetic base. It snicks on to the plate, so that sits right underneath the nozzle, and this plugs into the empty port right here. And that's it. You do your mesh. It generates the mesh for the bed, because the member of the bed is a... You, if you remember my discussion of 3D printers, there are two beds that you have to have. You have the physical bed, which is this here. Then you have the virtual bed that the printer actually moves on. Okay, Those two virtual beds have to be trammed. Because if you have your vir your virtual bed flat and this bed is crooked, well, it's not going to work. Or if this one's flat and this one's crooked, it's not going to work. These two have to line up 
so that it can print filament onto the bed. Um, the automatic mesh that you generate when you use something like this on a Delta printer, it does the internal math to pick the points on the bed and create that matchup between the virtual plane and the physical plane and you get your tramming. That's critical on a Delta printer. This is done very well. Um, it uses TMT 22A driver, so it is very quiet, except for the fact that this fan is really noisy. So I will be replacing both of these fans. You will need buck converters, 24 volts. So I'm going to replace this fan with something probably bigger and more powerful, but of a quiet variety, and replace this fan. Um, this is a pretty open architecture, so I think the lower cubic feet per minute of a quiet fan will be totally sufficient. A um, couple of um, notes. These symbols are completely assembled, and the kinematics is straight. So the attachment point for the belts goes around the bend, which keeps the belt shape straight. So instead of your belt being a trapezoid or a triangle or a pentagram, your belt is straight on both sides, which is going to keep the math simple, keep things accurate. I have no accuracy problems. I have no eccentricity problems. Round objects come out round. Two objects made to fit together fit together, so that problem is not here. Uh, so they, they did do, they did their homework basically. Um, I'm not super expert on deltas, but I understand the basics of the problems of deltas. Um, a couple things I don't like. The I don't know how they can fix it. Um, the these effector end connections here. I think they need a cover for them. I'm, I'm having a pretty nasty problem where this wiring loom will capture onto the end of one of the effector arms here, snag it, and of course the whole thing goes crazy. Um, the solution might be as simple as putting little veins right here on the carriages for the towers so that if a wire comes behind here, that little vein allows the wire, kind of like my anti-snag unit that I made for the Ender 3. I might design something similar to this. This cover comes off. It's a decorative cover. So I may reproduce this cover in plastic and then add that little extra so that the wire loom cannot snag. In the meantime, make sure you use the zip ties to attach the wire loom to the Bowden tube. That tends to keep, when, when, when it's up higher like this, it's not a problem because the wire, you can see here, it's horizontal. So there's nothing for it to snag onto. But when the effector head is down low here and you go to a max diameter um, situation, printing something large like this, this wire loom is not horizontal, it's vertical. And it gets behind one of these screws and snags. Actually, that one right there. <laughs> the wire loom gets behind that, snags it, and you're done. Um, I attach the zip ties to the Bowden tube. That fixed that. No more problems. Um, I don't like the spool holder where it is. Um, uh, this this spool holder, let me show you up here. Here we go. This spool holder is flat. So it's a flat, basically a flat plate with a slight rounding here where it's, the metal shape is bent and it screws into here. Well, the problem is a lot of these spool holders have little indentations along their circumference on the inner diameter here. And they tend to grab onto this relatively flat plate and then jerk over it. I can see that causing problems in prints. So what I will probably do is 3D print a little cap that slides over this to make this more rounded so the spool can roll more easily. I would also like to see them move this spool to the center of the printer instead of off to the edge. So move it to the center and then rotate it so it's still aimed at the feeder unit over here. This is your Titan clone feeder. Um, so move the spool holder to the middle of the printer here, and then just rotate it so that it's facing the, um, the Titan feeder, and I think that would be fine. I don't like it off to the side. It tends to make the printer unbalanced because that's a 2.2-pound weight, a 1-kilogram weight sitting off to the side there. Um, the bottom, I would like to see be a little beefier. It's not a big deal so far as holding up. That's a the cat walked through the printer and knocked the print head out of the way. <laughs> so it made a little spaghetti bowl mess. Um, the bottom is fine. There's nothing wrong with it, but I could see things being twisted a little bit. 
if I were to go and grab this printer and pick it up and carry it somewhere else, and uh, making the bottom a little beefier would fix that. It's just a would be nice to see kind of thing. It's not, I mean, this is working fine. I've had zero issues so far. It's a would be nice. Now, if you're the kind of person who likes to put foam under your printer, well, I got a surprise for you. It just so happens it comes with two pieces of foam that are actually part of the packaging that fit exactly perfectly. I have, a, I have a piece underneath here right now, and it fits exactly perfectly on there. So if you like doing that, there you go, built in. <laughs> um, not a huge fan of the MKS Robin, which is what this is using for its electronics, mostly because it's relatively proprietary. I believe um, third party people have gotten access and figured out how to access that and change the firmware on it. Um, I like the color screen, but what I don't like it when you go to pick a file is it has these stupid little icons. And so your screen is full of six icons and very tiny text and not all the text. So it's very hard to tell what you're printing. Basically the first word or two is all you get. Um, so if you have various versions of a file, you know, the stack rev3, the stack rev4, the stack rev5, well, you're not seeing the rev3, rev4, rev5. So you got to be careful naming your files as a result of that. Um, I do notice the feeder hot end combo sometimes have trouble keeping up. Um, every now and then, if I run fast like I am, I will hear that feeder skip. I'm not sure if that's a torque issue with the stepper or if I'm reaching the volumetric flow limit of the hot end. I'm not entirely sure. That would be something to experiment with. I mean, this hasn't caused the problems. It's a once in a while click. It's not like it's click, 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 and you're under extruding. The prints come out absolutely fine, and most of the time it doesn't do it at all. But that is something to consider in a Rev2. There's not much else that it works well. They did a decent job. I would like to see some lightning on the hot end to make it a little lighter if possible. I'd like to see some kind of management for these wires to be a little better. I love the fact that there's plugs here. That's fantastic. Um, allows you to change out the entire hot end even theoretically, although you'd have to unscrew everything to do that. I like that everything is metal. Everything's machined. There's very little plastic. There's no 3D printed parts. Um, there's a lot of fine details that they seem to put a lot of effort into. The Even the pulleys are adjustable if you need to. The pre-assembly of everything is fantastic. Um, what else? The switches here, very nicely done. They're little caps instead of the little micro switch levers, so nothing to get caught on to. I would like to see some feedback in the system. Deltas have an advantage most other printers don't have. You can home in the middle of a print. So it would be nice if the printer could sense when it got pushed and it could just rehome and then resume because you can rehome. Home for a Delta printer is up, not down. So all it has to do is rehome against its three tower switches and then resume the print. That's something a Delta can do that a regular Cartesian printer cannot do. Uh, I'd like to see them implement that. I mean, this is a low-end model, but maybe in their higher-end models, maybe that's something they can implement eventually. I don't even know if that's possible. How would you get feedback from the motors? There would have to be some kind of feedback system. The arms were all the same length. I didn't have any length issues because that's where you run into the problems with the Delta. You'll get skewing in your prints. Uh, let me show you some of the prints. So I printed this. Um, Farage 3D, I think that's his name made a vase mode bottle basically he needed a bottle to put stuff in and so i made a vase mode version of it i made a gigantic one of course but not on this printer <laughs> uh, that was on the chiron with a 1.2 millimeter nozzle but all of these were done on this printer and of course i did it in multiple sizes so then you have 120 percent scale and then you have 75 percent scale and then you have 50% scale, <laughs> and then you have 10% scale. <laughs> I love that. That's just funny. <laughs> I'm going to do a couple more scales just so I can have more nesting. I just think that's funny. 
some sample prints. First off, we printed the nut and bolt that came with the printer. And that's actually a pretty good print because it demonstrates that there's no ovality in the prints. The mathematical X and Y are correct, so the two parts fit together and they spin. As you can see, I'm just twisting, twiddling that. That took a couple turns, of course, to get that loose. Um, the parts print great. They print fantastically. The infill on this sucked, but that was a settings issue because the infill on my prints are coming out perfectly. So that's purely a settings issue that they use in their slicer. Wait, let me give you a close-up. You can see the knurling on that is fantastic. That's a, genuinely a nice print. And then I did my Marvin Group, which again, came out fantastically. I mean, really fantastic. I have zero, come on, here we go. I have zero issues about that whatsoever. They did a very nice job. Come on, autofocus, do your thing. There we go. So there's our Groot Marvin. I mean, they did a good job. <laughs> it's 270 bucks for a genuinely nice Delta that has a true 200 by 200 build volume. Uh, the slicer keeps telling me that the object I'm putting on there is larger than the print volume, but it prints fine, as you can see. This is um, 183 by 156, and it fits fine on the print bed. Uh, heat up. I'm really impressed by this. It's got a fanless 24-volt power supply. I guess it's because of how small the bed is. Because a 200-millimeter diameter is actually quite a bit smaller than a 200 by 200 square. I mean, you can see that here. These are about the same size. Okay, and as you can see, the square has a lot more surface area than the circle. Okay, so this would be like an Ender 3, and this would be this Delta. Okay, so even though it's got a similar build volume, you don't have a similar build area because you can't reach to the corners of that square. Okay, but it's a generous build volume for its price point and for its size, and this printer is hyper compact. I mean, look, look how small this is. <laughs> I mean, you can see I'm putting my hands on how tiny this printer is. Here's my phone. So it's a surprisingly compact printer with a decent build volume. And it's fast. I mean, you can see I'm cranking along here at 60, 70 millimeters per second. And it doesn't care. And no ringing, no ghosting, clean prints. So not bad. While I do not suggest Delta printers for beginners, if you want to dabble with a Delta printer, with a Delta printer, this is not a bad choice. They did a pretty decent job. There's a few minor things that they can correct that are non-fatal that you can easily overcome. Zip ties to prevent snagging. You know, watch out. You know, for the weight of your spool. Make sure the inside edge of the spool is clean so you don't have any snagging as it's rolling along on that platform. Um, be careful with your wiring, grabbing your tower effector connectors, whatever they're called, these joints here, the ball joints. Beyond that, not bad. I don't like the SD card being on the side. It's back here, but it's really not bad because of how tiny this printer is. Um, the SD card slot is a bit stiff, so you're going to push on it and think you have it in there wrong. You probably don't. It's just a really tight slot. You know, you gotta, you got to actually push a little harder to get it to go in. The travel for the spring is much larger than I'm used to. Usually the cards go all the way in and you go that little extra to click. This one, it's a big spring motion um, to insert the card. So it feels wrong, but it's not. Um, otherwise, very impressed. They did a good job. I'm going to keep making prints on it. I'm beating the piss out of this thing, making it work for me. It's producing um, 35 of these every 18 hours. And it's doing an excellent job so far. I have lots of failures, and none have come from this, so this is doing a pretty good job. That's it. Stay tuned for more later. If you have any questions, ask down below. Um, oh, oh, almost forgot one very important thing. Um, this has a switchable power supply. You have to switch between 110 and 220, and it's not easy to do that. <laughs> it's um, you got to stick a wrench through the bottom mesh here to an unmarked little switch inside the power supply, and you got to flip that switch. All right, so make sure this is not plugged in. If you are um, 
in America or any country that has 110 volts, you're safe. If this is accidentally switched to 220, nothing's going to happen. It just won't turn on. The little light will light up on the switch, but the screen won't turn on. That means you're in 220 mode. Unplug it. Use the Allen key. Find that little switch. It's right about here on the front. You have to stick it in through the hole and flip that switch. And then when you plug it in again, it'll work. It'll be on 110 volt mode. So FL Sun, if you could make that a little bit easier to do, because right now it's very hard to actually get to that switch. It's very hard to find the switch. <laughs> I had to look around with a flashlight and go, oh, there's a little unmarked switch in there. And I flipped it and it worked. So that is something that will need to be addressed. I think that's pretty important. You, do, you can't get to it from the top. You have to get to it from in here. Um, otherwise, that's it. One other suggestion I could make to FL Sun is to make the base of the printer as thick as the top of the printer. So duplicate this on the bottom here and maybe use a similar three bolt bracket structure that you use up there down here and then have a drawer down here. You know, put a drawer down here. Now to have this, the front of this printer, the thick like this, where this front is a drawer that opens up. You can put your tools and parts and stuff in there. That would be a really nice feature to see on a printer like this. In fact, that's nice enough that I might 3D print something to do that. Just because I think that would be that handy to have a little drawer down here. Or even not even a drawer, just an opening with a cavity in there where you can put stuff like, you can even stick a small roll of filament in there. You can put your your tools in there, a couple USB drives, you know, it'd, be, it'd just be handy, it'd be nice. Not a big deal, but, uh, you know, that's that, that little value add. You did such a nice job with the fit and finish of this machine. I had zero problems putting any part of this machine together. Everything fit where they're supposed to. The simple directions were easy to follow and not a problem. It's basically one sheet of paper, <laughs> okay? That's how easy it is, and, and, and a lot of this is set up. The, the walkthrough for the setup is very nice. The icons blink in the order you need to use them when you go to do your initial bed leveling. I mean, this is nice. This is as close as I've ever seen to a beginner-friendly Delta printer. Is it perfect? No. Is it very good? Yes. Will it give you excellent print results out of the box? Yes. Is the price good? Yes. Less than 300 bucks for a basically pre-built 200 by 200 Delta? That works great. That's not bad. Not bad. <laughs> Not bad at all. I would actually say this is superior to the QQS with the exception of build volume. In fact, I'd like to see you redo the QQS like this. Okay, Do the QQS like this. This is nice. But keep those nice covers that you have on the QQS. I like that. I like the covers on there. So That's it. You guys have a great day. I'm rambling on now. I will see you all later.